Good afternoon, uh, good morning, depending on where you might be tuning in from today, or welcome if you capture this podcast uh, as a recording on YouTube or wherever you might listen to podcasts. My name is Todd Anderson, Chief Content Officer at Fintech Nexus. This is another episode in our Crypto Winter podcast series. Uh, joining me today is Brian Korn, partner at Manette. Brian, if you could tell the audience a little bit about you and a little bit about the firm. Yeah, absolutely. Happy to be here. Uh, great to join this um, this this great series. Uh, I'm uh, Brian Korn. I'm a partner in the New York office of Manette. I co-head the financial services group. Uh, we are a 500 lawyer firm uh, across the U.S., uh, within financial services, I lead the fintech and blockchain initiatives. And specifically in blockchain, we have three main verticals, uh, tokenization and token issuances, uh, including the securities analysis around tokens, NFTs and the use of, of NFTs by, uh, uh, by the um, uh, entertainment industry primarily. And we've had several uh, uh, examples of that. And then DeFi, uh, where we work with uh, token protocols as well as others uh, to um, invest in the space, build out uh, compliant uh, protocols for investment and uh, ensure transaction uh, fluidity across uh, multiple sectors. All right. Well, thank you, Brian. And, and as a reminder to the audience, um, we have our Merge by Fintech Nexus event coming up October 17th and 18th in London. Uh, and this is covering fintech banking and Web3 and how they are merging together, hence the name Merge by Fintech Nexus. Uh, so now on to our topic for today, which is the crypto winter. And so, Brian, I wanted to, to kick off with um, a question related to, whoops, I think I, there we go. Sorry about that. Uh, a question related to what's happening uh, currently in uh, the market. Um, and so if you could tell us, um, you know, what do you think has been the biggest impact of the crypto winter thus far? Uh, and how have some of your clients been dealing with what's been going on in the markets? Yeah, no, it's, um, it's a great question. Crypto winter, which is uh, oddly during the summer, uh, has... <laughs> I think had a modest impact on uh, most of our clients. Um, generally, the uh, you know the the meltdown of uh, Bitcoin, Ethereum, and most other tokens uh, by about fifty percent or more since uh, uh, really April May uh, has uh, uh, sort of chilled the investment market in a lot of the crypto securities. Uh, obviously, companies that are public. And public reporting have had uh, issues, and, and also those that have um, that have merged with SPACs and are uh, uh, public through SPAC transactions uh, have seen a reduction in their stock price. Uh, but I think that it, um, it it has a modest impact on the investment appetite in the space uh, and the permanence that a lot of people feel towards the space. Uh, a lot of folks were looking at. Crypto as an investment option, obviously, uh, and something that was going to be a long term sustainable. And I think what it does is it shakes out some of the weaker hands in the space. Uh, it um, people who weren't 100 percent convinced uh, are probably backing off or staying away. Uh, but most of the investment that uh, we had before the meltdown in these prices uh, has really continued on. Uh, through the, um, you know, through the decline in the price and actually the stabilization of Bitcoin and Ethereum, which is sort of a proxy for the health of the crypto market, has really helped uh, enforce the, the permanence of the market. There are a lot of uh, pundits who are, who are big cheerleaders in the space. Uh, but I think you know, from our client's perspective, uh, it, it is a little harder to raise capital. But at the same time, uh, those who are really convinced and who and who are really believers in the space and the technology uh, have uh, weathered the storm. Are clients coming to you with with questions that are different now than, say, six, eight, ten months ago? 
um, are some of the same themes there, regulation, compliance, um, you know, how do they deal with, um, you know, some of the unknowns in the space? Is there any more fear from clients today than, than six or eight or 10 months ago? I think that the reduction in the, in the value of most cryptocurrencies combined with the uh, increased enforcement and regulation that we've seen uh, have started to take their toll. Uh, we would have clients come to us and say, uh, we have $10 million soft circled on a seed round or a SAFT investment. Uh, we just need it papered and we're closing next Monday. Uh, that doesn't happen as often anymore. Uh, most of it is uh, an iterative process. Uh, data rooms and due diligence are proceeding. And I think that uh, there is a little bit of a chill just because of the great rich quick uh, window that many perceive is is somewhat closed. Although if you read the uh, Skybridge report that uh, that Bitcoin is going to be at 300 K uh, mm -hmm. in, in a few years, then, uh, then, then they beg to differ. But I think that having uh, uh, the capital raising in, in, in place uh, and, and, and that mechanic behind it. Also, a lot of the, uh, the larger crypto trading firms, you know, Voyager uh, going through chapter 11, uh, the reduction in, uh, in, in stock price of, of things like ARK Innovation and, and, uh, and Galaxy uh, have, have had a little bit of a chilling effect, as has the meltdown of the SPAC market generally, which is outside of crypto, but the ability for a lot of these companies to have a SPAC exit uh, has been somewhat reduced by the chilling of the SPAC market and then the subsequent M&A market that follows the SPACs. Do you think long-term that uh, a period like this can be net beneficial to the industry? Does it alleviate some of the pressure that companies had to, to kind of build and, and transform financial services in such a short uh, period of time that just kind of alleviates some of that pressure and kind of lets people slowly build over time? Uh, I think that's true. I mean, you know, founders are obviously impatient by their nature. Uh, and so, you know, there is a go-go quality to most of the business plans that we deal with. Uh, but I, I have tried to convince a lot of people, and, and I think many of them realize that, you know, having a uh, a more of a slow and deliberate process where you do cover off tax and you do cover off the uncertainties of having uh, other intermediaries, uh, data protection, data security, uh, and, um, and, and, and and dealing with, with a lot of the regulatory issues up front uh, does make for a model that is more sustainable and one that I think in the end will have more staying power. Considering some of the the most prominent meltdowns, the the Celsiuses of the world, um, which for the most part have been related to centralized decisions by either an executive or executive team, um, do you think it helps to prove out some of the DeFi, um, you know, the DeFi crowd that says DeFi hasn't broke and DeFi is the only thing that that um, you know continues to perform well, um, or are there some you know kind of misconceptions about what's going on in the market, um, and um, you know related to you know C five versus DeFi? You know what are your thoughts on kind of the decision making in the the C five uh, angle and and how that plays versus the the DeFi crowd? So. Every DeFi protocol starts as a CeFi, right? There's no, there's no such thing as sort of an organic kind of big bang <laughs> decentralized platform where a, a computer code is launched into space and becomes self-executing. <laughs> so what I, what I tell people is that um, if you really want to be decentralized, um, then you have to let the machine learning and the AI uh, effectively take over. And there are a lot of entrepreneurs in the space that are uh, talking about how great DeFi is, but in reality would prefer a CeFi space where there's CEO and CFO. Uh, and so the, um, the centralized decision-making has been the downfall of a lot of these uh, and, and especially uh, when you have uncovered uh, 
stable coins, when you have uh, staking and, and, and lending that hasn't been done in a responsible way, uh, you know, th that, that kind of proves out the thesis of DeFi. Um, DeFi itself, as you, as you point out, has been very stable. Uh, the asset quality has performed as, as expected and as predicted. Um, obviously, the, the inputs to DeFi are, are centralized. Uh, if you're tokenizing a real-world asset, for example, uh, you are relying on the input contracts and the real-world asset to be real, uh, to be serviced while they're in the DeFi protocols. Um, and for there to be an accountability and verification system that is trustworthy. So nothing is 100% DeFi or decentralized, except maybe Bitcoin, because uh, you know it's so dispersed and so distributed that uh, very few people can and, and, and do move that market. But I think uh, in the DeFi space and DeFi protocols, you are seeing more stability than C5 because of, um, of those movements. Now, the, the problem with DeFi is that uh, if somebody has a great idea on how to improve something, it's not easy to do. <laughs> You're talking about a, in most cases, a, a, a voting protocol. Uh, somebody has to execute the changes. There has, you know, it's it's not a, a centralized uh, workforce and 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 change system like you have um, in a traditional bank or 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 investment bank. But I think that. Um, uh, you know, the volatility and a lot of the issues and mistakes, frankly, that we've seen uh, in crypto are are caused by human beings and 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 have been done on the C5 systems. Uh, to those who, who might be watching live, if you have questions, feel free to put them in the Q&A box and, and Brian will be happy to answer them as we move through our conversation here. What are, you mentioned some of the um, stuff with DeFi right there, but what are some of the other limitations that you see with where the technology is today, um, and you know, hopefully where it's it's heading. But what limitations do you see it facing the market overall as we sit here today? So I think DeFi has tremendous opportunities. I think that there's uh, a uh, a huge growth factor that we've seen. Uh, but we're still talking about people who are early adopters and people who are who are very crypto savvy. Uh, for for DeFi to truly be impactful, uh, it has to reach a much wider mass audience. And for that to happen, uh, even though DeFi is transparent, uh, it's it's clunky. It's not a form factor or a UI that uh, that you get from a brokerage statement. Uh, or a trading screen where you can see uh, everything lined up. Um, it has disadvantages in that the asset valuations are somewhat opaque and subjective. You can't always get uh, a, a real quote or evaluation on what assets are worth unless you uh, run through a, a long analysis. And by the time you finish that, it's probably outdated. Uh, so the liquid world, the, the securities and investment world, Will always have an advantage in that you you have this this immediate liquidity. Um, I think that a lot of the dexes are bridging that gap by um, by by listing some of these products and by having um, a real liquid market where people can come in. Uh, they don't need to know how to program or code. Uh, they can open up an account. It's a username password. Uh, you know, two factor authentication. Uh, but then you're in and it's something that can be done easily and makes sense. A transaction can be done in less than a minute uh, as opposed to, uh, you know, a, a longer dated analysis, you know, private equity or, or fund formation uh, in, in, in the offline world is, uh, is, is lots of documents, lots of signatures, PDFs, DocuSign, uh, and, and a lot of firms have really streamlined that approach so that uh, you're now able to transact mobily, uh, and you're able to do so in a way that uh, makes sense. But I think cleaning up the the user interface and and, and the form factor will enable uh, more people to come to the space and have more trust in the space. Regulation is is typically thrown out as a, a barrier, um, or at least a, a one of the impediments that that founders and and companies need to face. Is it? 
the biggest impediment that the space faces um, or is that, you know, kind of a convenient one at times? You know, it's 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 interesting. It 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 depends on what we're talking about with regulation. Um, regulation is inevitable. There's no, uh, there, you know, unless you're in the very early stages of technology, uh, which we had seen in the early stages of blockchain, uh, where it was completely unregulated, um, you're you're still going to have institutions that come in and protect, uh, you know, the innocent, so to speak from uh, sharp practices, from you know, the, the, the disadvantages and inconveniences of a decentralized world. We don't live in a decentralized economy. Uh, if I lose my PIN number for my ATM card, I haven't lost all of my money. Um, it, you know, it's, it's uh, transactions are reversible by and large. So I think that regulation is a threat, uh, but it's also an opportunity. And what I tell clients is that uh, they need to understand what the likely regulatory impacts are going to be and plan and budget for it uh, because there are no shortcuts. Um, what we've seen from some protocols who have tried to convince themselves that uh, you know something is not what it is, uh, is that in the long run, they end up spending more money and taking more time uh, to pay fines uh, for institutions and regulators who disagree with their analysis. Um, this space is littered with people who have taken a view on something, a directional view, uh, a regulator disagreeing with that approach and that having real consequences down the road. And so I think that there will be regulation. Um, part of regulation is, uh, is what we're doing now already regulated? Is this a horse of a different color? Is this a securities investment? Is this investment advisory? Is this broker dealer? Is this brokerage work uh, that's that's packaged in a way, but still underlying it as the same principles, and therefore regulators feel like it's it's already covered? Uh, or are we doing something that's new but still poses certain risks that would uh, would require a regulator to go in um, and uh, and again soften out the edges of the market? And a regulator can either do that through rulemaking or through enforcement cases, uh, like we've seen a lot of, you know, big expression is regulation by enforcement. Uh, nobody's going to tell you exactly what you can do, but we can all learn from a lot of these cases on what you can't do. And then you prescribe a path that uh, weaves through what's prohibited so that you don't repeat mistakes of others. The other way is for, uh, Congress or state legislatures or other international bodies uh, to come to agreements on what the rules of the road are and um, and and you know get a happy medium on on what the uh, world should look like. Entrepreneurs are reluctant to collaborate because it does mean that some of their trade secrets will be shared with the world. Um, there'll be transparency, there'll be uh, cooperation. And if you're in an industry where there's 25 players and your prediction is there'll be three after three years, then you know, collaborating and, and, and watering down your product and uh, uh, you know, agreeing to certain concessions may not be the most attractive approach. What, uh, what makes you or, or what products have you seen uh, currently in the market um, that make you excited for either further adoption of crypto or DeFi and, you know, what makes you most excited about the space? Well, I, I just think the, the returns that people can get through, through DeFi protocols is really interesting. Um, it, it's really democratization of securitization and, and structured finance. Uh, you know, in the, in the traditional world, the ABS world, that's an institutional market. Um, these are assets that are, uh, marketed by investment banks and sold to large hedge funds and family offices. Uh, you have the ability to go on to some of these protocols and invest in these same products that give you a fairly high return for a short term uh, hold period. And, uh, and, and you're really investing in the same way that, that some of the larger fixed income and credit funds are investing. I think that's interesting. Um, the whole metaverse and Web3 
which is part of the blockchain world, but it has its own life um, where we have clients that are building up virtual uh, houses and virtual neighborhoods and promoting their products and promoting their brands uh, through those means are, are, are interesting. Um, it's not interesting for everyone, uh, you know, just like certain types of music aren't going to be interesting for everyone. Mm -hmm. But there is a critical mass of people who are really into this space. And I think, uh, you know, it does skew younger, which will attract advertisers and others um, into that area. And then, uh, you know, I think I, I do welcome the clarity we're, we're getting a little bit on the Howie uh, issues, uh, the, uh, you know, the insider trading charges and, and the other issues around some of these protocols um, really clarify what uh, the SEC thinks is and is not a security. And if we can define that and agree on what aspects of a token make it a security and what aspects would not, uh, then for those that are not looking to issue a security, uh, they can design their, their platform around that basis. But again, Marta, the, most of the, the, the issues that you see with these tokens is that there's still a group of people who control them and tout their ability to outmanage somebody else um, in, uh, uh, in grading more value for that token. And the SEC has cited in its complaints that that is precisely what makes it a security. It's the yeah. efforts of these other people. You have bios from folks that say, I went to MIT or Caltech or wherever. Um, why would we care about that? It's decentralized, right? You're investing in a product that's controlled by human beings. Um, and you think that one aspect, one token will be worth more than another because of the efforts of others. And that is that is reading from the book of of the of the Howie Court. Um, it's amazing this case from 1946 still has legs, uh, and is uh, you know probably cited now more than when I graduated law school in the late 90s. Uh, but but it's it's amazing how uh, you know this this new clarity that we're getting on on interpretations, and maybe there'll be a new Howie, uh, or Congress will act through a number of laws that it has pending. Uh, that will bring, you know, regulatory clarity to the space. I know that Pat Toomey and Cynthia Loomis and uh, Kristen Gillibrand and uh, Tom Emmer, uh, a congressman in Minnesota, are, are all part of Blockchain Caucus. And, you know, there's a th there's definitely attention paid. I'm not sure how much will actually be uh, signed into law, but uh, that's another way that uh, that we can have clarity here. It feels like this version of the crypto winter is is different from past versions in part due to the it feels like the inevitability of some of this technology today than say 2018 and and earlier iterations of of the crypto winter do you feel the same way and um you know are we indeed on the path to some level of this wide scale adoption, whether it be pieces of DeFi or pieces of crypto or all the above? Well, I still I still think there's a large segment of the population that needs to be explained why any of this matters. Uh, we, we can explain blockchain technology and how interesting and cool it is and how it's transparent if you know where to look and you have an Etherscan uh, login and all of that. Um, but you know, a lot of people are looking at this saying, okay, it looks like computer, uh, 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 you know, it looks like Carta online. Um, what, 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 what value am I really getting here that I'm not getting before? On the other hand, uh, the ability to transact globally through centralized currencies or decentralized currencies, the ability, uh, I was reading about uh, two Argentinian soccer teams that, uh, made a trade through USDC. Uh, and if they had tried to uh, use their, their Argentine pesos to get a quote uh, on what the dollar equivalent would be, it would have cost them twice as much. Um, so the ability for you know, cross-national, cross-border transactions uh, to, to happen in a way that's transparent and trustworthy, I think is, is really exciting. Um, there is a permanence to to blockchain, but the question is what, what use will it have in every in everyday lives? Uh, how much adoption will there really be by people who are not in the industry? And that's really a measure of, 
of, of the success of the industry. Certainly for all of us who work in blockchain, uh, mm -hmm. it's exciting to see that that companies and startups are developing, that funds are being built uh, to invest in the space. Uh, but the, the space has to be, you know, there has to be a pot at the end of the rainbow, right? There has to be something that makes life easier than, uh, than the world without blockchain. For the internet, it took a while, but now it's obvious why yeah. the internet and, and mobile platforms are, are easier than, than before they existed. I'm not sure we're there yet on blockchain. And I would say that a good part of the population still needs to be convinced. Yeah, like why would the everyday person who can go to dinner with their friends, split the check on Venmo, pay with their card, get a bunch of rewards on that card, get reimbursed through Venmo, why would they care if any of this is run on blockchain? Right. Well, that's that's precisely right. And that's is is I mean, is there a way or is it just over time this just gets slowly adopted and the systems that banks and others are working on are transformed and the everyday person doesn't really need to know? Well, I think that that could be uh, where we land. I think that there's a lot of back office systems and other protocols uh, that will improve everyday life uh, or enhance everyday life. You think about collectability and, and you know, not everything's going to have a, a, a consumer interface. Um, but the speed of transactions, the verifiability that you have uh, with with uh, with these transactions, I was um, I was registering a new car the other day, and I was amazed just how, how the VIN number system works. You can put in a VIN number, and everyone knows exactly what car it is and where it is, and what kind of make and model, and all of that. Mm -hmm. Well, blockchain is a lot like that. You have a hash number or a transaction ID. Um, then your transaction can be verified. Uh, now, for many transactions, it doesn't matter if it's verified because I'm on a closed network system. I'm using my my Chase card or my City card. Um, you know, they know who I am. The card, the charge goes through, and they bill me, um, and that works great. But as the world becomes more and more open, um, and people feel the need to transact with others um, in in more and more places, this this just lowers the barrier to entry. Uh, by a significant degree, especially working across borders. Well, Brian, I, I appreciate you you coming on the show and, and giving your perspective. Um, and um, how can, uh, if someone wants to reach out, how can they uh, find you and, and find Manat and, and talk a little bit more? Yep, happy to uh, to chat with anyone on LinkedIn uh, on uh, the Manat uh, website. Uh, Manat is M-A-N-A-T-T dot com. Uh, and my email is bkorn at manat, M -A -N -A -T -T com. Happy to talk to anyone and, uh, and, and, you know, participate in this process as we move forward. All right, Brian, thank you for joining us today. Thank you to all our viewers we had and to those listening until next time. Thanks so much.